In this video, my goal is to share what I think is the fastest way to get cinematic quality terrains inside of Unreal Engine uh, in the fastest way, uh, without any sacrifices uh, when it comes to quality of the end results. Uh, my goal isn't to show the end-to-end -end sort of pipeline of making a, a massive outdoor environment in Unreal. Um, this is just going to be a very short focused tutorial on how I approach making uh, real world or terrains that are based on real world data. Uh, and it'll take, you know, for your first time doing it, probably half an hour uh, from start to finish to get in a terrain that uh, is incredibly rich in detail uh, and natural like this here. And the uh, the simple secret, it's not really a secret, there are lots of people doing this, um, but if you're new to terrains, uh, then the simple secret is that uh, we actually don't make the terrain. Uh, we just, we're just using uh, open source data from the real world. Um, so many countries have their height maps freely available, uh, and since I'm British, uh, I'm going to be looking and using at the, looking at and using the the UK lidar uh, open source data. So what I'm going to do, uh, and if you want to follow along, then uh, the first thing you should do is you should open up uh, a blank, well, open up Unreal, um, and I'm going to make a new level. Uh, I'm going to create a new level from the time of day template, which was introduced uh, into Unreal from, I don't know, 4.25 or 4.26 and beyond. And uh, if you're in Unreal 5, there's a similar template in there. So uh, yeah, this has already got a lot of what we need to make a really high quality, uh, sort of large scale uh, ter outdoor terrain environment. Uh, we've got volumetric clouds, which help sense sell that sense of scale. Uh, you've got a, a sort of light that reacts to, um, if you hold control L on the keyboard, you can move the sun around like this and the time of day and the color of the light will change. Uh, and you've already got a sky atmosphere in here, which is going to kind of simulate the correct amount of uh, Raleigh scattering in the atmosphere that gives that distant objects that kind of blue tint when they're far away. So these are, these, these, this kind of takes the, uh, the burden off of the artist of having to convey that realistic sense of scale. All you need to worry about doing is getting in the real data at the real size. So that's what we're going to move on to now. So just use your search engine uh, and you can search, if you're going to use the UK data, you can just search UK LiDAR DTM like that. And the first thing that's going to come up is this LiDAR composite DTM, uh, one meter uh, from 29 data, 2019 data. So this UK data, it doesn't actually include uh, Wales or Scotland, although that some of their um, data is available online elsewhere uh, if you search for it. Uh, you could also search US uh, open LiDAR DTM, and I, I'm, I think I'm quite sure that there is uh, plenty of, uh, of data from, from the United States as well. If we search again, so US open source height map LiDAR data with some kind of combination of these, these uh, search terms will eventually find, take you to, the, uh, to a place where you can sort of access the data and download it. Uh, what you're looking for is uh, the USGS, uh, USGS uh, data in there you can you can search for that uh, that height data but be be wary that uh, you you've got to look at the resolution of the data you're downloading and if you want to create a really high quality terrain you're going to be looking for data that is uh, that is one meter per pixel like this and that is one meter per pixel uh, in the x and <laughs> that's what one meter uh, sort of horizontally uh, it doesn't it doesn't include the vertical axis in unreal that would be the the x and y and z being up so the Z data is a it's it's 32 bit pixel uh, depth image that you're going to get from this data source, and that's uh, that's contains enough data to to contain a really really high range of uh, different height values. So once you're on this page, which I'll put in the description, you just go to Survey Download, and uh, it's going to open up this map, which is interactive. And uh, I'm not going to restore the state to where I was previously. I'm just going to go in and navigate to somewhere that I think will contain interesting terrain. And uh, this can be like, you know, a little bit, a little bit, if, if you don't know what you're looking for, it might be hard to, to find a useful bit of terrain here. So what I tend to do as well is I'll just open up Google Maps. I'll change to satellite view. It's got a nice 3D viewport. I might actually zoom out first and let's go and sort of get to the right area of the of the UK first. I think I want to go up sort of roughly like, let's say, let's say Northumberland National Park is going to have some interesting, interesting elevation data. I'm going to go back to the 3D view by just holding shift and then moving the mouse around. And we're just looking for a nice sort of interesting shaped valley or river formation. I'm not too worried about this. If I was doing an actual project, I'd spend a lot more time location scouting. 
And uh, I think this is where you run into one of the major advantages of working this way rather than trying to do a procedural terrain, which is that you, uh, you, you really do have the opportunity to location scout. Um, you, you don't have to imagine something and imagine that, you know, starting from a blank screen or a blank piece of paper can be really tricky. Uh, it's like, how do you differentiate your procedural mountains from another procedural mountains? How, how do you get that sense of character that you want? And, and you completely sidestep that if you go out and location scout. And our world is enormous, you know, it is absolutely huge. And there's is, is just this almost limitless number of unique sort of terrain formations that allow you to really go in and sort of settle on the look that you want. Uh, for, for your project. Um, we have some pretty fantastical terrains in the real world. Uh, so I'd highly encourage that you, you you do this. It's sort of like working from the best reference you can imagine. Um, and don't feel bad about it either. Uh, you know, there, 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 there's no, there's no like, um, you might have the sense that it's not doing thing pro things properly if you, if you, if you don't take, if you don't make the terrain yourself, if you take this route. But you know, in it, it's in essence, it's all just about conveying your vision, uh, uh, that your overarching goals. Unless you want to be uh, uh, specifically a procedural terrain artist, in which case, go ahead. Um, but the, a, a terrain artist has a really difficult job because you're not just trying to make the terrain look natural. You're not not well, not always anyway. You're not just trying to make the terrain look natural uh, and getting in some nice erosion, which is you know, sort of something that these tools are really good at doing. You know, World Machine, uh, Houdini, Gaia. A world creator but there's all sorts of other kind of man-made erosion ma animal-made erosion which these softwares don't really account for and you have to go in but yourself and m add those manually or write your own procedural scripts to do it it's and, and and at the end of the day it it's still going to be some kind of combination of noises and uh, impressions and abstract of what a real landscape looks like and you can get really really good at doing that but it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time to get to that level where you can create the kind of detail that exists in a real world terrain, get all the history of the thousands of years of processes that have acted on it. So sorry for the little spiel there, but um, you can, as you can tell, I feel quite strongly about this subject. And that's because I've uh, spent the last six years of my career largely working on terrains, or at least terrains have played a large part in what I do for a living. And uh, <laughs> I was mildly opposed to taking this route at first, but um, it, you know, I guess all art is an imitation of nature in, in some form. And uh, in the end, I decided for me, it was more important to, uh, to get the, to, 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 to kind of achieve the overall goal that I was setting out to accomplish rather than becoming one of the world's best uh, terrain authors or designers. Okay, so spiel over. Um, I found the area that I want. So I'm gonna go into the air like this and have a look. Barrow, Barrow Burn, that's, that's the nearest, uh, that's the nearest, kind of town or settlement, but also white bur burn shank. And let's have a little zoom out there, make sure we're oriented north. Okay, so I can see Northumberland National Park and Barrow Burn actually comes up quite soon. So I'm gonna hope that the same thing happens on this survey download. I'm gonna go up to roughly where Northumberland is. As you can tell, I, my geography is not great because I'm gonna to have to constantly jump between the two. Um, I'm gonna use this sort of point here as the guide and zoom in from there. And hopefully we're gonna find Barrow Burn and uh, if not, I'll have to look for another another kind of sign. Uh, I think I may have to go for another sign. Find 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 another another not sign, but you know, sort of location. Hey, is this a sign? It's a sign. Fox no. Okay, so let's have a let's have a look on here. See if we can see Fox no. Okay, that is taking me way 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 out to the wrong place for UK there. Um, so I'm going to close that down again. And Shilmore, what's the first thing that comes up? We've got, okay, so it's actually a little bit across from that first one. We've got these big major roads and it's sort of roughly in the middle. So let's have a little look there. Again, big major roads, sort of roughly in the middle. And Alwinton, Alwinton, let's have a little look. Oh, there's Alwinton, we're sort of getting closer now. Barrow Burn is up here somewhere. I'm gonna find it. Barrow Law, okay. That seems Barrow Burn. There we go. Found Barrow Burn. So now we're going to go in a little bit closer again. And just, I need to find that, that specific valley that I was looking at. I really like the way this river snakes down through this valley here. So I think we're going to be able to see that exact river. Uh, in fact, I think that is just this river here. And you can see, okay, great. So you can see now that there's this grid uh, with these, with these uh, sort of, uh, this key sort of telling you which tile it is. NT8 uh, 1SE. And the, the area that I'm interested in 
um, kind of comes down through these two tiles. Uh, and to begin with, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get this first tile because uh, it's the one of most interest to me. But I'm gonna get the data. I'm gonna kind of prepare to get the data for each of these for each of these uh, tiles around it, just in case I decide I need them. So in order to download the data, I need to move my mouse up to the top right of the screen here, and you can see there's this download this your data um, download your data drop down. And I'm just gonna click the polygon to draw. You could also do a freehand, but polygon works fine. And I'm just gonna left click left click, left click, and then double left click to complete the square. And I'm gonna hit get available tiles. And this is gonna take a moment because it's trying to find uh, these nine tiles. So each of these tiles essentially is a 5K uh, resolution 32-bit image. So it's quite quite big, quite, you know, quite a lot of data. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just gonna take a while to sort of retrieve that from the database. And uh, What's going to come up initially is this LiDAR composite DSM, and we don't want the DSM because that's a digital surface model. Uh, this means it's going to contain anything that contributes to height elevation when viewed from above. That could be buildings, trees, uh, etc. Uh, it might be useful for some applications, but we're just interested in the in the raw DTM. Okay, and we want the uh, 2020 data because it's the most recent, and we want it in one meter accuracy. Not all of the UK is covered uh, in some places, uh, probably around military bases uh, or in areas where they just haven't finished the scan. Uh, it's, it, they, it's not online yet, um, or it may never be. Uh, so we're just going to hope we got lucky and we got these tiles. Uh, the, the vast majority of England is, is on here. And I'm just going to go ahead. I, the one I'm interested in to begin with, NT81SE. So I'm just going to find that, NT81SE. I'm going to click that to start the download. And it's going to download provided you've got a reasonably quick internet connection, it won't take too long. Okay, so I'm just gonna extract that. I'm gonna open the folder and you see you get all of these things. And uh, the, the, the file that I'm particularly interested in, you get a bunch of shape maps for use in software like um, uh, QGIS or, or other GIS mapping software. Uh, but we're just gonna use uh, this TIFF. And uh, this is where I'm going to jump over to Houdini. So if you don't have Houdini, uh, you can very easily get a hold of it, um, get an apprentice download to, to sort of view this data in there. Um, so I'm just going to go search Houdini. I'm going to go to the uh, get. I'm going to go to buy. Uh, and once you're in here, uh, you see there's a free learning edition. So one major caveat here is that the apprentice edition uh, won't allow you to export any textures above uh, 512 by 512, which will completely scupper this uh, terrain workflow. Um, I, use, I have an indie license, uh, which is not too expensive, although if you're just getting out of um, university or you're still studying, it's probably quite a lot. Um, hopefully your school, if you are a student, does have the Houdini education license, which is different to the apprentice license, and that does allow you to export in high resolution. Uh, if you're at a 3D school, uh, I would highly recommend, and, and they don't have Houdini, then I would highly recommend pushing them to get Houdini, whether that's for pre-rendered, where they probably already have it for VFX, or if it's a game kind of games course where they may not have it, then uh, Houdini's really made some massive leaps and bounds with regards to its games workflows. And I think it should be uh, a major sort of topic at any uh, games education course now. So get onto your lecturers if you don't have it. Uh, so yeah, uh, if you wanna just follow along with the Houdini portion of this tutorial, you can download the free version of Houdini here. Uh, if you want to be able to export your results, then you will need to get the uh, Houdini Indie license. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. If you don't have Houdini, this is a Houdini tutorial, I suppose. So inside of Houdini, um, if you're unfamiliar with it, don't worry, we're not gonna have to do an awful lot with the interface. Um, so actually just to kind of push that point home a bit, I'm just gonna go and minimize uh, all the bits of the interface that I don't need um, by just clicking that little black arrow bar for each of those. And hopefully that already makes Houdini seem a lot less intimidating. I can even remove this here. So we're basically just left with these three panels. Uh, so this top right panel is the parameter interface, uh, which we will use. Um, this should be familiar to you if you come from 3ds Max or Maya or Blender. It's when you click on an object, you have a bunch of properties you can change. And in the bottom right down here, we have the, uh, the empty network view, which is where we do most of our work. This is the 3D viewport. Um, okay, so First things first, I'm just gonna click in the network view on the right over here, and I'm gonna press tab. That's gonna bring up a little search dialog here. Um, and I'm gonna, you can also get to that by right clicking, but I'm gonna use tab most of the time. I'm gonna search geometry. So right now we're in the object level, which is like the kind of uh, container for a bunch of different pieces of geometry. But because we're just working on one height field here, uh, we're just gonna work inside of this geometry container. So most of the time, if you're a modeler, this is kind of how you will use Houdini as a beginner. 
And once in here, I'm just going to type in hf file. And that's going to bring up this height field file node. So you can see I, taught, I, I wrote hf, which is just a shorthand way of writing height field. Uh, and we can search hf by itself to bring up all of the different operations you can do to work on a height field. Uh, or you can just kind of manually find it in here. But frankly, I would encourage you to look through this for sure. Uh, but when you're working, um, it's probably more useful just to try whack in a few terms that relate to what you want to do. Like, I don't know, so I want to reduce my model. What, what am I going to do? Oh, poly reduce. Um, it's, it's a great little search functionality there. So now that I've opened up the, uh, I've, I've loaded up this height field file node, you can see it's created just this default, uh, default plane. Uh, there's no information. Oh, there is an information. I never noticed that before of this butterfly. Um, but we actually want to get that TIFF, which we downloaded. So I'm going to go to, uh, go to downloads and I'm going to see if I can find the that, that folder that we just downloaded. I've got a lot of stuff in here. I really need to tidy it up a little bit. I think it's this top one, and yeah, that's right, because of the date. So now I'm just going to double click that. Tip. Okay, so that is unfortunate. Uh, we've found a portion of the terrain which is actually missing. So at this point, I'm going to go to a, do a bit of a cheat. I'm going to go, here's one I did earlier. Uh, and I'm just going to get one of those other portions of terrain that I downloaded previously. And you can see that when it loads in by default, it's uh, the elevation is uh, is whack, uh, and it's not. It, it appears to be whack. And actually, the the, the elevation isn't the problem. Um, coming from that uh, that TIFF, that geo TIFF, uh, it's actually got the correct um, kind of value to so that correlates to the actual altitude above sea level. So we don't want to start scaling it um, in the uh, in the height axis here. We want to leave the height scale at one. Um, and what you need to you essentially know or find out is that each of these tiles is five kilometers by five kilometers uh, along, you know, from one end to the other. So uh, what we should do instead, because Houdini's just going to uh, anticipate that it's one kilometer by default. So we're just going to change that to 5,000. And straight away, that's going to give us the correct uh, appearing terrain data. And we can just take, take a little moment to admire that terrain and how easily we got it uh, without having to do any real work. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly crisp and it, it in, includes all of those kind of subtle details like the meandering river, um, little sort of animal trails and human made paths that would just take so long to do if you were trying to do yourself. And beyond, and not, and not only that, it, it's, it contains sort of data relating to which side, uh, it, which side is facing north and south because the sun and heat would erode those faces differently. And all of these things are things you would have to add by yourself if you were making the terrain by hand. Um, it's important to note that Unreal has some very specific requirements when it comes to trains, or at least some considerations that you need to be aware of. Uh, so one thing that I find myself referring to constantly is this landscape technical guide that Epic uh, released years ago. And there's a couple of things that you can glean from this document, which I encourage you read fully if you are going to be working it with terrains a lot. And the first one is the recommended landscape sizes. So it's best if you, you pick one of these and stick with it. We can see that we've got 8K, 4K, 2K, effectively with you know slightly different to texture map resolutions which would be a power of two and i'm i know that i'm working with data that's 5k and it's five kilometers and i i want to get as close to one meter a pixel as i possibly can uh, i don't want to use the 8k map because that's uh, just uh, going to be a huge huge landscape that will be horrible to work with in unreal so i'm going to make sure that i'm actually uh, going to export this landscape in 4k resolution so that's the first thing we can glean from from that guide there and there's a couple of options. Um, the previously mentioned height field resample node, uh, which will resample the input data. Uh, if I click this little I, you can see that it says 5K by 5K. But this resample node can uh, actually be a little bit unpredictable. Uh, it's great when you're editing the terrain inside of Houdini, but I would recommend taking another route if you want to export a terrain to Unreal, which is we just create a new empty terrain, uh, an empty height field here. And you can see that it's a lot smaller by default. So we're going to set the size of that to 5K by 5K as well. I'm just going to quickly leave it between them to verify that is in fact in the right place and the right size. And uh, now the division mode is by size and grid spacing too. So if we click I here, you can see the resolution is 2500 by 2500, which isn't what we want. We want to just set the resolution. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go division mode. I'm going to set by axis and I'm going to manually type in 4033, which is the resolution that we can see that Unreal supports and is one of the recommended landscape sizes. I'm going to hit I again just to see that indeed is 4033 by 4033 there. So now that I've got these this kind of 
uh, empty target terrain and this source file, I'm going to use a node called height field project. And I'm going to plug the output of the height field one into the green input pin of the height field project. I'm going to plug the output of the uh, height field file into the white pin here. And I'm just going to go ahead and view the output of that straight away there. It'll take a moment to think as it's effectively rendering 4K detection. Or it might be helpful to think of it as if it's rendering a 4K texture, although that's not necessarily what's happening under the hood. And uh, you can see now we've got this 4K version of that same data, um, and it's it's pretty close. You know, it's it's losing a little bit of crispness. Um, we've got less than a meter per pixel now. It's like maybe a, a pixel every meter and a half. Um, but I think uh, you know that's just a necessary trade-off we take here. Uh, I would advise you as a starter or even someone who's used Unreal a fair bit, do not go down the world composition route in Unreal. Uh, it's going to take a long time to get that set up and working effectively, and it introduces a whole load of complexities and problems. Your, your best bet, even if you're making a large environment, is just to stick to one terrain, okay? Um, that is something I would strongly advise you against is going down the world composition route, especially if you're a beginner. I would also advise you against doing an 8K resolution terrain. Um, if you're making any kind of shipping product like a like a like a, a game, um, even if you're just working on a sort of pre-rendered cinematic, having an 8K terrain with lots of different layers for sort of weight maps and things uh, like how you texture it, uh, it's really going to chug and be ho horrible to work with. And in most cases, having faster iteration times far outweighs having the like double the the density of terrain data. Um, but you know that's my that's my advice. Take it if you want. So. We've done this little height field project. We've got our terrain. It looks good. And we want to take it into Unreal. So at the moment, we don't really know how tall this terrain is apart from just eyeballing it. So in order to scale it correctly in Unreal, uh, we have to take into account two things. Firstly, we have to actually know the height of this terrain and also ideally uh, where the sort of lowest point is in terms of altitude, like above sea level. And secondly, we have to know what Unreal's default landscape height size is. And that's where we end up referring back to the landscape technical guide. And uh, let's have a little zoom through here. And you can see, so to calculate a custom height requires the use of a ratio to convert your custom height value into the minus 256 to 256 range. So the height range is a total of 512 units. That is 512 meters tall. So great. You know, you think, okay, if my mountain range is less than 512 meters in height from top to bottom, that's going to be totally fine. The problem is you're going to be pretty limited in the height of your mountains if they can't be taller than 512 meters. And it might work for the majority of large hills in the UK. But if you actually want to put in any big mountains, you're going to have to sort of scale the height of your terrain a bit. And as expressed in the documentation, to do that, you're going to need to know the ratio that you're going to have to scale the imported terrain by uh, when you bring it into Unreal. So just because this is a little point of confusion, um, this 512 meters uh, assumes that zero uh, in the texture is, is zero. So a value of zero is black, is nothing. And that's going to correspond to zero or in reality, minus 256 units. And a value of one is going to be 512 meters high. So, so if you export a grayscale map and it sort of looks correct, then the tall and, and, and it encompasses the full range of values from black to white, then the tallest mountain you're ever going to get is going to be 512 meters. And if you don't have a, a pure white value, it's only ever going to be less than 512 meters. Okay. Now, this is just a moment where we're just going to go and have a look back at that file that we got from uh, that we got from the uh, the internet. And we're going to open it up just in Photo Viewer. It's going to look a bit weird. Okay, that's not the best example because that's the one missing some data. So I'm going to go and find one of those other DTMs. Here we go. And we're going to open it up. And despite a weird preview at the start, you're going to notice that it just looks white. And this is because um, the every value uh, in this in this image is above one. It's an HDR, it's an HDR image, okay? So every value above, above one, uh, this photo viewer doesn't know how to read that. So it's all just going to be white. It's clamped to one. So we need to convert the output, you know, from Houdini into a, an image format that is just zero to one. It doesn't go above one. It's not HDR, which means we're going to have to do. A, we're going to have to export it as a 16-bit image, not a 32-bit image. So, okay, that was quite a lot of information without any demonstration. So, I'm going to now go through step by step. The first thing we're going to look at is how do we find out the real height of this terrain? 
So I'm going to type in HF remap. I'm going to plug the output into this first pin on the left here. And I'm going to change it to the pre to the remap. And you're going to see nothing updated in the viewport. And that's what we expect. But with this remap selected, you see if I'm on project, we're going to have different parameters. But if I click on the remap again, it's going to bring up the parameters for the remap. Uh, you can see that there's just a button called compute range and layer to remap height, which is fine. We're just going to hit this compute range button and we're going to change the output min to zero and the output max to one. So that's how we're kind of compressing the image. And you can see this input min and out input max, that actually tells us the altitude. So we can see that the lowest point of this terrain is 71 meters above sea level and the highest point is 851. So we're going to have to make a note of these values. We're going to have to remember them. We'll come back to them in a minute. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do HF out for a height field output node. We're going to take the output of the remap and put it into the input of the output. <laughs> Confusing uh, terminology there. Um, so we're just going to plug that in there. And we don't need to actually focus this remap or the output. We're just going to go back and focus the project so we can see the real terrain. Don't worry that it looks like a viewport. That's not, not relevant, really. So we're going to open up the, we're going to drag a box around or select the output. And uh, we're going to see that. Uh, Right off the mark, uh, it's got a whole bunch of options for us to change. We can set a file name, we can press save to disk, we can change the format, the type, and we can choose what channels to export. And uh, straight away, I'm going to go and change it to single channel because we only want to export a single grayscale map for the height. And then we're going to change the, uh, the type to a 16-bit fixed because that is the format that Unreal likes. We're going to go down to the image channel. And in this red input, uh, this is just a single channel and it calls it red we're going to choose the height. And you see here, it's now created an additional drop down, which allows us to do an auto remap uh, or a manual remap. And the reason I haven't gone with that route is because we actually wanted to see what the altitude of this terrain is so we can we can work out what the, the conversion ratio is. If we'd done an automatic remap, we would have no visibility on what those height values were. You could also do a manual remap, um, but I just thought it would be helpful to break this into two separate steps. Okay. You also have the option to set the tiling, um, so divide it into tiled maps for something like world composition. But uh, just going to reiterate, I would advise you against going down that route if you're a beginner. Okay, so now we need to set the file name for export. But up to this point, I haven't actually saved the project that I'm working in. So I'm going to need to do that first. I'm going to go up to File. I'm going to hit Save As. And just going to find a location on disk that I want to I want to put this in. Um, I'm going to create a new folder here. I'm going to call this workshops. And I'm going to create a new folder here. And I'm going to call this uh, workshop one LIDAR terrain. Since this is my first YouTube workshop. And then I'm just going to call it as well, the same as the folder name workshop one LIDAR terrain dot hit. Okay, great. This is where we're going to take advantage of uh, some of uh, Houdini's relative kind of like commands and paths. Um, so we could just go and find a, a location on this that we want to export to, but that would require navigating and being organized. And I like generally, I generally like things to be organized without me having to always be organized myself. And uh, what I can do there is I can just type in dollar hip, and that's going to look in the save directory of the project. So we only need to set the location once, right? So hip, that's just, it's useful to remember that dollar hip like that means look inside the directory, the folder, where the project file itself is saved. OK, now I'm going to type exports. So it's going to create a subfolder called exports. And I'm going to call this LIDAR height.png because I want to export it in PNG format. And I'm going to tag this as height in case I want to export any additional information, for example, layer information uh, later in the same directory. And with that, all I need to do is hit save to disk. It's going to take a moment to render. This time it is actually rendering a texture a 4K texture on disk, and I'm going to wait for that to finish. Now, I could, of course, navigate through the folder structure, through Windows Explorer to where I created the project uh, and find the files there, but that's just a really slow way of finding files. And um, the way I like to do it is I'm just going to go to this file chooser. I'm going to go up to look in and right click expand path, control A, control C to get all of that text. I'm going to then open Windows Explorer and just paste that. And that's going to take me straight to the to the uh, folder where uh, where I've output the images and we, we see we've got the LiDAR height there. Okay, so we've got that on disk. It's a roughly 4K image. And the next step we're gonna do is uh, jump inside of Unreal. Um, actually, one last comment. If this is all black or all white, it means that you've somewhere messed up either the bit depth of the image or the remapping 
um, that we did. So you need to make sure that the height field remap, um, if I go back to that, is set to output min zero and output max one. Okay, so we've got this on disk. Uh, I'm gonna open up Unreal and I'm gonna just hit F11 there to jump out of that full screen preview. And I'm gonna use Shift two on the keyboard to bring up the landscape uh, mode. Uh, if you press Shift one, that will put you back in your regular mode and Shift three takes you to foliage, Shift four takes you to brush editing, Shift five mesh paint. So I'm just gonna go back Shift two to landscape and I'm gonna click import from file. Okay, so I'm gonna just paste that path again that I copied earlier. I'm gonna hit open. And you can see we get this preview uh, of the data before importing it. Um, now, this is an important thing to uh, be aware of, uh, which is that Unreal is going to assume that one pixel in your in input file correlates to one meter inside of Unreal. So the resolution is 4033. So it's going to assume that it's uh, 4K by 4K uh, plus like 33 meters. Now, obviously, the terrain itself that we, we actually downloaded is 5K by 5K. So we need to apply a conversion ratio uh, in the X and Y. And it's a very simple way to do this. Uh, we just get the calculator uh, up and we type 5,000 uh, divided by 4,033. You, you see, that gives us this horrible number. Um, and we're just going to have a quick look over in the X and Y scale of landscape here. And we can see it's not actually 111. It's 100, 100, 100. So we just need to multiply that by 100 to get the true scale. So 123.97 uh, something, something, something. Uh, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to grab that by clicking on it, control A, control C. And then I'm going to paste that in here. And it's automatically going to update both the X and the Y axis, assuming that the landscape is, is uh, square by default. Square? Yes, square. Okay, so you might think this is the point to hit import, but you would be wrong. And that's because we haven't actually applied the ratio to the Z axes yet. So remember what I told you? Uh, a scale of like one, or in Unreal's case, 100 on the Z axis is actually only ever going to go uh, between zero, minus 256 meters and positive 256 meters. Uh, ergo, we have 512 meters total height range for the landscape. Now, if we go back into Houdini, uh, when we look at the remap, we can see that we've actually got vastly different values. It's going between 71 and 850 meters. Okay, so uh, what we need to do now is we go back to our trusty calculator and we do the very similar process to what we just did for the, uh, for the kind of X and Y axis, but we do it in the Z axis. Uh, what's the, where's the clear button? There's gotta be a clear button in here, hasn't there? Oh, there we go, cool. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna copy the input max and I'm gonna paste it. And then I'm gonna press uh, minus I'm going to get the input min and I'm going to paste it and hit enter. And that gives us the actual height range of the landscape we're working with. So 779.743. And now we're going to do uh, the same thing we did with the X and Y axis. Um, we know that the maximum height that Unreal actually has by default in, in, uh, is 512 meters. So we're going to divide that value by 512 to give us the ratio between the two. Uh, flip, quick flip back to Unreal shows us that Z is by default 100, not 1. So we do need to finally multiply this by 100, and that gives us our Z scale. I'm going to paste that in there, and you can see it just got offset a little bit more. And now this is the true scale of the landscape, so I can go ahead and hit Import. And there you have it. We have a one for one, uh, I just hit shift one to switch out of landscape editing mode uh, and F11 to full screen it. And you can see we now have the correct one to one scale landscape that we extracted from um, from the, uh, yeah, from Google Maps. We have a little flip back to Houdini. You see there it is in Houdini. Have a little look inside of Unreal and there it is in Unreal. And we know that this is all geographically speaking, um, as close as you could probably hope to get a real terrain uh, to being in Unreal. And that's the end of the workshop. Uh, it's, uh, I hope that you can see that that doesn't require any, particularly, any particular um, technical skills um, beyond kind of, um, I suppose, just downloading and getting a little bit familiar with how to use parameters and, and the node graph in Houdini. Um, anyone, I think, should be able to get up and running and do this very quickly and benefit from all the glorious detail of a real-world terrain uh, in no time. All right, thanks for your time. Thanks for watching uh, and good luck.